Today we'll be taking a look at what may be the most memorable and widely known classic noir of all time. It's certainly true in my case, in any event. What I'm talking about is the 1941 film The Maltese Falcon. And as I'm about to explain, there are actually a few good reasons why The Falcon has such a stellar reputation. The story about the story. So there I was in my last LP, talking about how inventors and innovators always have someone on their heels ready to take the credit if the first guy should fail. And here's an example that proves the rule even applies to films and cinematography. Citizen Kane, which came out just one month before the Maltese Falcon, was lauded for the way it advanced the art of filmmaking, with new and advanced makeup, visual effects, and sets with actual ceilings that allowed for things like low angle shots and more natural set lighting. And all of this was accomplished on a remarkably small budget. The Maltese Falcon, which was being filmed at the same time by a different studio and on a similarly undersized budget, managed to come up with a lot of the same innovations independently, along with a few new ones of its own. Every last shot and camera angle was planned out months in advance of filming. And like Citizen Kane, the indoor sets were constructed complete with ceilings, a step so rare it was practically unheard of. And all this happened despite the fact that it was John Huston's directorial debut, and no one knew yet that the man would later go on to be a legend of Hollywood. Another new innovation was the fact that the film actually adapted Dashiell Hammett's novel. At the time, it was widely held that there were too many differences between books and films for a faithful adaptation to ever be possible, so screenwriters wouldn't even bother. Instead, they used the characters in the plot outline to tell their own stories, and while they would often become famous tales in their own right, they only bore a passing resemblance to their originals. Consider the 1931 Universal movies, Dracula and Frankenstein. The Maltese Falcon had actually been adapted for film twice before. The first was a 1931 pre-code production, which was actually pretty faithful to the original. In terms of plot, that is, and not in terms of the tone. And it also benefited from being able to leave in Sam Spade's adulterous ways and the homosexual subtext surrounding Gutman and Cairo. However, the film wasn't particularly successful thanks to being one of the awkward children of the first talkie generation, and attempts to re-release it later were blocked by the Hayes Censorship Office. In response, Warner Brothers put out a second version in 1936 titled Satan Met a Lady, and this time the movie was an outright comedy meant more as a way for Warner to give the censorship board the middle finger than as a way to adapt Hammett's work. The Maltese Falcon also happens to be a continuation of the story surrounding an earlier film, High Sierra, which was released in January of 1941. High Sierra was Humphrey Bogart's first ever leading role. He'd been stuck with tough guy gangster roles up until that point. And it was also the last hit film John Huston needed to write in order to get his chance to direct. The two men were actually longtime friends and drinking buddies and they would go on to collaborate on several more famous films in the years to come. Another two actors with interesting histories are Peter Lorre and Sidney Greenstreet. Lorre was a Hungarian actor who was big in the German film scene before the Nazis killed it, most famously appearing as a creepy pedophilic serial killer in Fritz Lang's M. As a Jew, Lorre wound up fleeing Germany in 1933, and the Maltese Falcon was his first major role after coming to Hollywood. Meanwhile, Green Street was a stage actor of some renown, who wound up crossing over from Broadway after a personal request from Warner. As it turned out, the shifty Lorry and massive Green Street were such a perfectly mismatched pair, they went on to appear together in nine separate films. The Story The movie begins with a historical text scroll, but it's inaccurate to history and to the film, so let's just ignore it. After establishing that we're in San Francisco, we go to the office of Sam Spade and Miles Archer, private detectives, and their secretary, Effie, lets in a lovely young woman covered in furs. She says her name is Wonderwood, 
and she's looking for her sister, whom she believes has run away with a man named Thursby. Partway through her discussion with Sam, Archer comes in and promises to tail Thursby personally. However, in the next scene, the only scene in the movie which isn't told from Sam Spade's perspective, Archer is at the corner of Bush and Stockton when someone comes along and shoots him dead. Sam gets word of his partner's death soon after. The first thing he does is call his secretary and tell her to break the news to Archer's widow Iva so that he can keep his distance. He then goes down to see the body and talk with Tom Polehouse, a police detective, who explains that Archer didn't have his gun out. The shooter was close enough to burn Archer's coat with a flash, and he still had money on him when he died. The implication is thus that someone Archer knew shot him over a personal matter. Notably, Sam isn't particularly put off by his partner's death, and he seems somewhat more curious when he discovers that Wonderly has already checked out of her hotel. Later on, Sam gets a visit from Tom and another detective who start by asking him questions about how Archer's wife is doing and how many guns Sam owns. Sam grows understandably agitated at this point, so the cops get to the point. While they doubt that Sam killed his partner, he did disappear for a while after he left the murder site, and soon after, Thursby showed up dead from four bullets in his back. The next morning, Sam heads to his office and discovers Iva waiting for him. Their affair is subtextual thanks to the Hayes Code, but it's clear enough that there's something there, and Iva thinks Sam killed Archer so that he could have her all to himself. Sam isn't too happy about her attitude and shoes her out. After which Effie comes in and points out that Iva was apparently out and about when Archer died, too. But then Wonderly calls, and asks Sam to come to her new apartment. When he arrives, Wonderly explains that her real name is Bridget O'Shaughnessy, and her earlier story was a lie, a lie which Sam already knew about. She says that she regrets what happened, but she still can't tell the truth, nor does she want the police to find her. Sam agrees to help her since she's his client, and he also praises her ability to act innocent as she begs him. Sam pushes her for more information, so she explains that she and Thursby had just arrived from Hong Kong, and she's certain Thursby killed Archer even though the gun found on him was a Luger. Sam doesn't like how things are going and how little he knows, but he agrees to keep helping Bridget for what she says is the rest of her money, $500. That evening, Sam is back at his office when Joel Cairo, played by Peter Lorre, drops by and asks Sam to find a bird figurine on behalf of his client, offering $5,000 in exchange. However, Cairo then pulls a gun on Sam and states that he'll be searching the office now, thank you. Unfortunately for him, Sam knows a few things about wrestling a gun away from someone at point-blank range. And after knocking him out, Sam searches Cairo's pockets and discovers a handful of foreign passports, a theater ticket, and a perfumed handkerchief. When Cairo wakes up, he's remarkably calm about the whole situation, and only seems puzzled over why Sam bothered to fight back when the bird isn't in the office. But Sam explains that this was because he doesn't like being held up, and so Cairo reiterates his $5,000 offer, and then searches the office at gunpoint again as soon as Sam gives the gun back. Some time later, Sam loses a tail and then heads back to Bridget to see what she has to say about Cairo. They wind up kissing, but Sam still can't trust her, so they arrange to meet with Cairo at Sam's apartment. On their way in, they pass Sam's tail from earlier, along with Iva sitting in the car, and as the three talk, it becomes clear that Bridget and Cairo know each other, they know about the bird, and Bridget wants to get rid of it before the fat man catches up and kills her for it. They're interrupted when the two detectives stop by. While Sam knows he doesn't have to let them in, Cairo suddenly screams for help. It's hard to say what happened, exactly, but Sam lets Cairo know that everybody has the ability to lock everybody up in this case, and so Cairo shuts up as Sam invents a story about kidding around, so the detectives will leave. Once they're alone, Bridget tells Sam a new story, about being a petty thief along with Cairo and Thursby, who stole the bird from its previous owner without knowing why their client wanted it. Sam doesn't believe her for a minute, but he also can't help bending down for another kiss. The next morning, Sam confronts the boy tailing him about working with the fat man, regains Cairo's trust, and then meets with Bridget back in his office. She says her apartment was trashed, 
so Sam arranges for her to stay with his secretary. Then Iva stops by to apologize for sending the police to his apartment last night. Finally, the fat man, Gutman, calls, and we start getting some answers about what's really going on. Gutman, played by Sidney Greenstreet, starts in with a drink and some flattery, and then begins to probe Sam for what he knows about the birth. Sam says Cairo offered $10,000 for it, but Gutman scoffs at the number. Sam then asks what the bird is, but when Gutman refuses to explain, Sam gets pissed off and starts throwing bottles, threatening to walk away unless he gets answers. From the way Sam grins as he leaves, you get the impression that it was mostly an act. And from the way his hand twitches, it's clear that it wasn't completely an act. Sam's next step is the DA's office. He isn't saying anything to the police because they'd only get in the way, and they'll have to charge him if they want to get anything from him. That afternoon, Gutman caves and explains the bird's history. In 1530, the Knights Hospitaller were granted the Mediterranean island of Malta by the Spanish crown, and in acknowledgement, they had to send a Maltese falcon as tribute every November 1st. A real bird, mind you. And this part of the story is historically accurate. However, for their first year's tribute, the Knights decided to craft a pure golden statue of a falcon one covered in jewels. But the bird was lost to piracy and took centuries to resurface. Eventually, it showed up in Paris, now covered in a black enamel to conceal its value. But a Greek merchant discovered what it was and then died before Gutman could get his hands on it. For the next 17 years, Gutman searched for the bird, eventually finding it with a Russian general in Istanbul. The general wouldn't sell, so, Gutman hired Bridget and company to steal it. When Sam says he can get it, Gutman offers to pay him a total of $50,000 or even more, but at the same time he also drugs Sam, so it's hard to say if he's being honest. As Sam collapses, Cairo and Wilmar, the tail, come out of the back room and everybody leaves. When Sam wakes up, he calls Effie and finds out that Bridget also left and hasn't come back. He then searches the apartment and discovers that Gutman was interested in a ship called La Paloma, which was arriving that day from Hong Kong. When Sam gets there, the ship is burning down. Fortunately, it's empty, but Bridget is still nowhere to be found. But when Sam gets back to his office, the ship's captain comes in carrying a wrapped parcel and dies on the office couch. The parcel is the Maltese Falcon, and Sam immediately conceals it by having it checked at a random hotel and mailing the ticket to his post office box. Meanwhile, Bridget calls and seems to be in trouble, but when he gets to her location, he finds an empty lot and nobody in sight. When Sam goes home, Bridget is waiting for him, and so are Wilmar, Gutman, and Cairo. So begins the longest, tensest scene in the movie, the centerpiece which resolves everything and pulls a great performance out of all of the actors present. Sam says he has the Falcon, but he needs a fall guy to take the rap for the three murders. He suggests Wilmot, who did shoot two of them, but Gutman refuses. He's like a son, Gutman says, and he knows too much about the Falcon. But as the discussion continues, Wilmar gets upset, and Sam knocks him out. Gutman then explains everything that happened. He approached Thursby to make a deal for the Falcon, but Thursby refused out of loyalty to Bridget, and Gutman made an example out of him. The ship captain was likewise one of Bridget's allies, and in the course of their second escape attempt, Wilmar shot him. And the earlier call was Gutman's ploy to get Sam out of the office before the captain could arrive. In the end, they decide to blame everything on Wilmar, and Sam calls Effie to get the package for him. When it arrives, Gutman eagerly tears it open, and we see the Falcon for the very first time. We even get a nice 360 spin for the camera. However, when Gutman starts chipping at the enamel, he discovers that it's a lead copy. And while they're busy with that, Wilmar slips out the door. Cairo realizes that the Russian general must have made the copy when he found out how valuable it was. And for his part, Gutman looks like he's ready to have a heart attack. But then, he cheers up. They may not have the Falcon, but they know where it is. And what's another year or two after spending 17 tracking it down? Even with Wilmar gone, Gutman and Cairo leave the apartment in good cheer, and Sam immediately calls the police on them. Finally, Sam, 
confronts Bridget to find out the truth. And Bridget is essentially helpless now that Sam isn't accepting a lie for an answer. Bridget shot Archer, and she shot him to set Thursby up for the murder to get rid of him. When Thursby turned up dead, she went back to Sam and used him as a way to protect her from Gutman. Sam tells her that he's going to turn her in because she killed his partner, and because he has no way of knowing whether she loves him or even if she loves anyone. This upsets Bridget, but it's hard to say if it's because the man she loves has given up on her, or because, for the first time in her life, she can't bat her eyes at a man to make her problems go away. The film ends as the police show up to take her away, the elevator bars closing in on her like the bars of a cell. Final Thoughts So what exactly is the difference between a good movie and a great movie? For me, the answer is simple. It's the quantity of the quality. If a film gets one thing right, it's at least worth seeing. If a film gets several things right, it's worth seeing more than once. But if a film gets everything right, ah, then it becomes a classic that can cross generational boundaries and become a cultural touchstone that can easily outlive the era that spawned it. A film that gets everything right has a soaring score that can stand on its own and yet incorporates itself so deeply into the scenes that you can hardly remember it. It has cinematography that perfectly captures the visual language and tone of the movie, so perfectly that the viewer doesn't even realize what the camera angles are doing to their perception. It has sets and lighting designs that reinforce the movie's setting and themes and capture the essence of the film's reality even when it isn't realistic. A great film is stocked with great actors who know exactly how to play their roles and play off one another and it has a director who can fix whatever mistakes are made until all that's left is exactly right. It has a story that can make anyone shut up and think about it, and themes that are both obvious and thought-provoking. A great film also has a symbol, a hook, something you can boil down into the shallow soup of pop culture but which doesn't completely lose its shape when it's taken out of context. The Maltese Falcon itself, the stuff that dreams are made of serves that purpose for this movie. So that's why I figure the Maltese Falcon has become the icon of film noir. It not only defines many of what would become the genre's cliches, including the femme fatale, the private detective, the liberal use of guns and violence, the shifting loyalties and the less than upstanding protagonists, but it also goes above and beyond what you'd expect from a 1941 movie with full sets, well-designed camera angles, novice film actors who would create some of the most memorable characters ever put to film, and a story adapted by a freshman director who would become one of the geniuses of post-war Hollywood. So yeah, when you put all that together, I'd say it's easy to see how the Maltese Falcon would become such a hit. Thanks for joining me again for today's film review, and I hope you'll join me next time for another Bogart film whose story is so famously convoluted that even the original author had trouble getting it straight. <laughs>